So before we get started, this video was a request by one of the wonderful subscribe star bros. This is a pretty good video for the current holidays, even if we're a tad early, by a few thousand years. Who are you? My fellow brothers, I, Billy Harrington, stand here today, humbled by the task before us, mindful of the sacrifices borne by our Nico Nico ancestors. We are in the midst of crisis. Nico Nico Doga is at war against a far reaching storm of disturbance and deletion. Nico Nico's economy is badly weakened, a consequence of carelessness and irresponsibility on the part of management, but also on the collective failure to make hard choices and prepare for a new mad age. Today, I say to you that the challenge is real. They are serious and they are many. They will not be easily met or in a short span of time, but know that Nico Nico, they will be met. Yeah, we're talking about the Prince of Egypt. So for those unaware, Prince of Egypt is the 1998 animated musical adaptation to the story of Exodus and the life of Moses. It covers the time frame of when the Hebrews left ancient Egypt to escape slavery, up to around when the Ten Commandments were written. That's right, bitches. We're getting religious. So, Prince of Egypt came out during a very interesting period of time. The 90s. How 90s are we talking here? The cast was made up of Ralph Fiennes, Patrick Stewart, Michelle Pfeiffer, Sandra Bullock, Danny Glover, and Val Kilmer. Very fucking 90s. It was also directed by about three different people, Brenda Chapman, Steve Hickner, and Simon Wells. Now, the reason this is a pretty interesting movie to discuss is because of the exact goings-on that was happening in the film industry in the 90s, specifically the animation side of things. The 90s is referred to as being part of the Disney Renaissance, which is when Disney released a ton of beloved and acclaimed films, one after the other, pretty much showing its strength as a powerhouse studio. Now, Disney's been going on for almost 100 years, and it's had its ups and downs as each era passed by, going from downright historical classics like Snow White and Pinocchio, to more so going quiet and releasing more forgettable films, then skyrocketing back up and being beloved. The 90s was part of the upturn, since this is actually where a lot of the properties that you guys enjoy came from. Little Mermaid, Beauty and the Beast, Lion King, Mulan, you even had the beginnings of Pixar. This was a major time period for animation in Hollywood, and other studios wanted to cash in on the trend. Specifically the studio that made Prince of Egypt, DreamWorks. Yeah, DreamWorks is another interesting story. They're not strictly a family studio like how Disney paints itself out to be. Now nah, they have more than their fair share of more mature demographic properties. Hell, DreamWorks would go on to release American Beauty, Gladiator, and A Beautiful Mind, which are all pretty heavy R-rated films. And much like Disney, they had a division that dealt with publishing anime films in the West. Only instead of working with Studio Ghibli, they handled a variety of things. DreamWorks technically distributed Millennium Actress and Ghost in the Shell 2 in the West. So while you might think that this is all a cynical move by a studio to cash in on the booming animation trend that Disney and Pixar pushed in the 90s, no. DreamWorks actually ended up being a pretty serious contender. Hell, to this very day, they have a thriving animation department. They just released the new Puss in Boots movie that people really like. They also released stuff like Kung Fu Panda, How to Train Your Dragon, Shrek, and Monsters vs. Aliens. That last one went on to help ruin a generation of men, and only those who know, know what I'm talking about. In fact, Prince of Egypt in particular brought DreamWorks a lot of good attention. Like, first non-Disney animated film to be nominated for Academy Awards attention. It even won Best Song. So don't think this is just some cheap Sunday School Disney knockoff. This actually has some legitimacy behind it. Hell, some of you guys might have actually been super excited to see the notification for this video, because a lot of people did in fact watch this as kids. Which is kind of funny when you think about it, because you wouldn't expect an animated adaptation to a Bible story to be fondly remembered among the general audiences, especially nowadays. You see, religious films sorta have a reputation now of being cheesy, low-budget affairs that care more about the proselytizing than telling the story in a fun or compelling way. That's not to say there are no good films out there that cover religious themes, it's just, you know, everyone knows what they are, they're Hallmark bullshit. In fact, you might actually be surprised what's out there. Sure, it's fun to dunk on stuff like God's Not Dead, because that series is just downright goofy and only made to appeal to other believers in Christianity, but you also have films such as Passion of the Christ, which became the third highest grossing R-rated film of 2004. Mel Gibson's working on a sequel, by the way, that's going to focus on the resurrection, so that could actually be interesting. You also have The Last Temptation of Christ by Martin Scorsese, which... Funnily enough, did get into some controversy due to the fact that it depicts Christ as a more human figure, dealing with things such as depression, despair, lust, and uncertainty. 
though it's still very clearly respectful of the source material. I mean, Martin Scorsese grew up in New York as an Italian, you tell me whether he's a Catholic or not, and he simply wanted to adapt a different version of events and play with the idea that Jesus did take the offer from Satan to run away from his responsibilities to die for mankind. If you watch the movie, you know that even with everything that happened, it never says Jesus was a coward or anything like that. It, it, it clearly does still care. Scorsese also did the film Silence, which was about the Japanese genocide of Christians in the 1600s. That tackled themes of faith, sacrifice, selfishness, and being forced to renounce your way of life in the face of oppression. I understand your pain. I was born into this world to share men's pain. I carried this cross for your pain. While Scorsese does address things such as uncertainty and having doubts, these films don't pull a Seth MacFarlane and say religion and religious people are stupid. No, there's way more under the surface. Definitely check out these movies because they're very good. There's also Kundun, which is about how the Chinese communists invaded Tibet. Yeah, this one got buried. And Prince of Egypt is in a very similar vein. Now, some of you might be putting some pieces together and going, hey, uh, Moses and the Book of Exodus was about 1600 years before Jesus. And you're right, but at the same time, Old Testament material is pretty much the groundwork to every Abrahamic religion, from Judaism to Christianity to even Islam. In fact, this movie was banned in majority Islamic countries for showing prophets of Islam, namely Moses. I'm gonna let the irony sink in there, but yeah, they have a law where they are not allowed to physically and visually depict their prophets. Now, to explain the plot of the movie, let's get a little bit of the history out of the way. You have ancient Egypt, roughly 1513 BC. Uh, during the reign of the pharaoh Seti, father to Ramesses II, ancient Egypt was flourishing with a massive empire. They also enslaved a race of people known as the Hebrews, also referred to as the Israelites, in order to build grand monuments to memorialize Egyptian figures. The Hebrews were convinced they would eventually be freed and the Egyptians punished for their cruelty. Seti, fearing that the Hebrews were growing in number and could plot a revolution, ordered a mass murder of male Hebrew children, having them thrown in the Nile and fed to crocodiles. Moses was spared the slaughter because his mother, Jochebed, Jochebed? Jo Jochebed? How the fuck do you say this? We are looking at how to pronounce the name of this biblical character. She was a daughter of Levi and mother of Aaron, Miriam, and Moses. How do you go about pronouncing her name? Jochebed. Jochebed. Okay. Jochebed. Yeah, Jochebed hit him, uh, putting him in a cradle and flowing him down the river to escape the Egyptian soldiers. He was found and eventually grew up as, ironically enough, the adopted child to Bithia, the daughter to Seti. Hey guys, Saul Goodman here. Now for full clarification, since Loli is a massive idiot that doesn't know shit about ancient history, let me clarify some things. Because no doubt you guys are typing a storm in the comments about none of this timeline adding up. Since Moses supposedly led the Hebrews from Egypt when he was 80 years old, and Seti became Pharaoh around 1279 BC. You see, the actual timeline of the events of the Old Testament are debated to this very day. In fact, None of the Egyptian pharaohs in the Exodus really ever got named. They have titles that approximate who they are. So there's no way to just find a name and cross-reference it with the time of their reign. We don't actually know that it was Ramesses or Seti who were pharaoh at the time of Moses. It's simply become part of the zeitgeist that Ramesses was the one to feud with Moses due to pop culture. And the fact that Ramesses was the inspiration behind the poem Ozymandias by Percy Bysshe Shelley, referencing a great emperor who leads his kingdom to ruin out of pride, which directly correlates with the themes of Exodus and the plagues of Egypt. There's no proof that Seti ever had a daughter, and especially less proof that she would have been Bithya. But it's generally agreed upon that if Moses existed during Seti and Ramesses' rule, then he would have been adopted into their family. It's very shaky ground, but this is the thesis we have to work with. Simply because there's not enough information out there to make a definitive judgment. And the film Prince of Egypt completely ignores the existence of Bithya, replacing her with Seti's wife, Tuya. So to summarize the situation, we don't know who Moses was really adopted by, but most everyone believes that it was Seti, as he was the father of Rameses and he's the pharaoh, most believed to be the one to bring the plagues upon Egypt come Exodus. If this all sounds confusing, it is. In fact, there's an entire list of pharaohs that historians debate as the real subject of Exodus, all spanning across the BC era 
and throwing the timeline into even further chaos. So for the sake of simplicity, we're going with the SETI and Ramesses interpretation. Thank you. Have a good day. I'll piss on your grave, you bald fuck. So he became the adopted family to the Egyptian pharaoh that tried to kill him and his people. Now it's actually not really known who Bithia really was. Even the name is just a term to describe her rather than an actual name, since Bithia comes from the term bat Paral, or literally just daughter of pharaoh. There is also the terms uh, thermosis, which was the Greek translation, and Leviticus calls her Bithia, which is the Hebrew phrase daughter of Yahweh, essentially calling her the daughter of God. Technically Yahweh. Yahweh is the deity described in old school Judaism, considered their god, and he would eventually evolve into the idea of God that modern religions worship. Despite being part of the Pharaoh's family, Bithia is a held figure in old scripture due to her compassion for Moses, which allowed him to survive and eventually lead the Israelites out of Egypt who were considered God's people, and to a land of their own. Some versions of the story even go so far as to claim that due to her act of mercy in adopting Moses, God himself chose Bithia to be his daughter, essentially blessing her for the rest of her days. She also supposedly renounced her faith to the Egyptian gods and converted to the Hebrew ways. There's even multiple versions of the story. One of them says Bithia knew Moses was a Hebrew and wanted to save him from the mass murder, even getting a Hebrew wet nurse to take care of him, which supposedly just so happened to be his actual mother, Jochebed. Another version says that Bithia was a leper that was healed when she saved the child. A third version says that her handmaidens tried to talk her out of saving the baby, and Gabriel himself came down from heaven to kill them. So yeah, it was a really good idea to save that baby. <laughs> Don't even get me started on the Islam version. That flat out says Bithya, referred to as Asya, was tortured to death for saying she believed in Allah. Islam version is a lot less fun. There's a lot of details that each story adds or takes away. One of them outright states that Bithya was spared losing her firstborn child when the plagues ravaged Egypt, even leaving with the Hebrews to the Holy Land, but I'll talk about that later. You get the point. There's a lot of shit that different versions of the stories talk about. Just the finding of Moses alone has a ton of detail that's argued about to this very day. Prince of Egypt doesn't really struggle with this, instead breaking it down to be about as simplistic and recognizable as it can get. Moses was spared from the murder of the Hebrew children because his mother floated him down the Nile. He was saved by the Pharaoh's family and adopted as their son, unaware of his origins. The film really focuses on the relationship between Moses and Ramesses. This version of the story proposes that Moses and Ramesses were very close as brothers, outright best friends. In fact, it goes so far as to be a, pretty much the emotional throughline of the entire film. Ramesses and Moses' relationship is the major connection in the movie. Prince of Egypt paints the Exodus as a tragic event, a betrayal and having to give up one family to protect another. In fact, this is a pretty damn dark film especially compared to other animated films that were coming out at the time. It covers themes of genocide, human suffering, slavery, murder, divine punishment. This for sure gave a kid nightmare somewhere. Now the film's version of events says that Moses was made aware of his roots when he coincidentally ran into his brother and sister, his actual ones, who are slaves. Despite not believing them when they say he was of Hebrew origin, it causes him to have an identity crisis, eventually learning of the crime Seti committed decades earlier. Since then, Moses can't help but focus on the suffering the Hebrews endure, even being disgusted by how his family talks about the slaves as if they're lives that don't have value. This culminates in Moses accidentally killing a slave driver who was beating a slave and fleeing the empire, even after Ramesses swears to cover up the crime for him and make it seem like it never happened. Moses then wanders the desert before running into Jethro and his clan of wandering shepherds. He's then taken in as one of them and even marries his daughter, Zipporah. During his time with the shepherds, Moses has an encounter with God, doing him as a burning bush in a cave. God orders Moses to return to Egypt in order to free the Hebrews, and warns that Egypt will suffer ten plagues for their cruelty, each one escalating in horror and destruction, starting from turning the Nile into a river of blood and ending with the deaths of every firstborn son in Egypt. Some stories also say it's just every firstborn child and not just every son. Uh, if I remember right, the movie kind of just makes it, makes it more so just the firstborn child. Moses tries to talk Ramesses into letting the Hebrews go before the plagues ravage Egypt, but he's insulted at the idea, seeing Moses as a traitor who abandoned his family over a slave caste. This causes God to unleash his full wrath on the empire. Now, there are some differences in how the plagues are told in the Bible and the movie. 
Some versions say that Moses himself summoned them, others say it was God and Moses was simply the messenger. The movie is pretty vague about it, since you do see Moses perform some of these actions himself, but it does lean a lot harder into he's just the messenger side of things. The only thing you physically see him do is turn the river to blood, which is played off more as a threat, despite that in itself being a plague, since it meant the people of Egypt couldn't drink from the Nile, which was the only water source for miles around, because it's a desert. And it does make sense, because, I mean, little kids would probably shit their pants if they established it was Moses causing people to die of starvation and disease. Probably a little too much too soon, you know? Regardless, this all ends with the death of Ramesses' son, taken during the final plague. He finally gives in and allows the Hebrews to leave Egypt, though he quickly becomes consumed with vengeance, chasing them with his army to the Red Sea, where famously, Moses splits it and allows the Hebrews safe passage, only for it to crash into the Egyptian army and drown them, and the movie ends with the Ten Commandments being written. Now, as stated, this is a more general adaptation of the story rather than a point-by-point -point one. It really pushes the tragedy aspect of things, of Ramses and Moses growing to hate one another. The beginning of the film shows a lot of scenes where the two are hanging out and having fun. It has a light-hearted and whimsical tone to it. Even when Moses returns to Egypt, Ramses is clearly happy to see him back. Moses! Where have you been? I did you for death! <laughs> <laughs> Look at you! Both men truly cared for one another, but their paths were simply never going to end well. Ramesses was desperate to prove himself as a strong and powerful pharaoh, raised his entire life under his father's strict standards. He could never show weakness or compromise, he had to be the might of Egypt. While in contrast, Moses learned about his role in the world. He wasn't the king of the Hebrews or anything like that, he was simply the servant of God that must face his destiny, whether or not his old family would agree or not. There's even a pretty sad scene where, after the plagues are unleashed, Moses and Ramesses have one last conversation with each other. Despite everything that happened, Moses now seen as an outright apocalyptic figure to the rest of Egypt, the two men still enjoyed reminiscing over their childhoods. There's even a hint that Ramesses wants to give in, and let Moses and his people leave, but he has to bury it in the presence of his son, even promising to carry out another mass infanticide to punish the Hebrews for the plagues. And so the last one has to play out. Moses instructs the Hebrews to sacrifice a lamb and paint their doorposts in its blood. That way they're protected from the curse to follow. God himself, or an angel of death, it depends on which version you read, passes through Egypt and kills every firstborn child, including Ramesses' son. To make it worse, Moses tries to console Ramesses for his loss, but what could even be said? He simply tells Moses that him and his people are free. To which Moses leaves and breaks down crying in grief. Even if he was simply the messenger of God, he never wanted the pain and suffering to continue. He simply wanted the Hebrews freed from slavery. But because of Ramesses' pride and stubbornness, many more innocents had to be dragged into things. If he chose to allow the Hebrews to flee Egypt, his empire would not have been punished by God. Maybe they would have even been blessed. But because he was scared of being the weak link, he felt that he needed to show a strong hand at all times, even if it meant fighting God Almighty himself, and that could never end well. Like, homie, the guy can make it rain fire, what the hell are you gonna do? Honestly, Prince of Egypt feels more like a Shakespearean tragedy version of the Exodus story, which makes sense, because some of the cast have experience in that field. Patrick Stewart and Ralph Fiennes, to be exact, they outright starred in Shakespearean adaptations before. They took the story of the Exodus and emphasized the family and betrayal aspects, showing the breakdown of the brotherhood between Moses and Ramesses, and how their feud causes so much more damage to the world around them. Now technically, if we're going off the real story of the Exodus, Ramesses and Moses wouldn't have been brothers, since he was rescued by the daughter of Pharaoh, who would have been Seti at the time. Meaning if we're going to be completely accurate, it would have been more of an uncle-nephew relationship, but changing it to be more of a brotherhood makes the conflict more personal, and helps them avoid accusations of ripping off the Lion King. Plus, it's easier for little kids to understand two brothers fighting than explaining the weird-ass circumstances around Bithia and her role in the Old Testament, because she doesn't show up at all. By the way, this probably wouldn't need to be said, but uh, I'm not a religious scholar. I'm getting everything off Wikipedia. I have zero clue what I'm doing. I just wanted to talk about a funny animated movie where the fat guy sings you're playing with the big boys now, because I'm a big boy and I, I want to play with the, the big boys now. Watch Wendigoon if you want like an actual accurate deep dive into religious scripture. I'm actually out here in nature because I've determined that Magic Spoon is made not by humans, but by magical elves. And I have ventured here far out into the wilderness to kill them. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention that this is a musical. Or did I? 
Screw it, who cares? Uh, yeah, this is a musical. There's a lot of song numbers, some of which are actually pretty great. I'm not a big fan of musicals, just not really my thing, but even I was enjoying more than a few of the sequences here. The song that plays during the plagues is legitimately epic, and really sells the scale of destruction that you're seeing, making it very clear that Pissing Off God is downright horror movie material. But another thing I really liked about the film was that it had more than a few moments that were quiet and subtle. When Moses meets God, it's not a loud and bombastic sequence. In fact, the filmmakers went out of their way to avoid that road. They debated back and forth on who should voice God, how they would handle it, and they came to the conclusion that they should have Val Kilmer voice both Moses and God, to essentially sell the idea that God was an inner voice speaking through Moses. He speaks very quietly and carefully, only having bursts of powerful yelling when he's trying to display how powerful he is in comparison to Moses. So I will stretch out my hand and smite Egypt with all my wonders. It's actually a pretty clever portrayal, and definitely a different take. And I will say, the scene where the firstborn are killed is genuinely haunting. It's very quiet and understated, simply watching God or the Angel of Death, whichever version you personally go by, flow throughout Egypt and suck the life out of every child. There's no terrified crowds or bombastic music, it simply plays out and allows the visuals to sell what's going on. The visuals, by the way, are pretty great. This movie still holds up. The animation looks nice, and they do have pretty creative sequences. Not just the musical ones, though those are also pretty great. There's a scene where Moses discovers the truth of how Seti killed the Hebrew children, and it's told through Moses sinking into a wall of hieroglyphs, watching the images come to life and play out in front of him. It's very clear that there is heart and soul put into the film. This was somebody's baby, and a lot of people legitimately grew up watching this. Whether or not the religious aspects really matter to them or not, there's probably tons of atheists that love Prince of Egypt, because a well-made movie can make anyone happy, even if the demographic was completely different than intended. Hell, I actually had a lot of fun reading into the context of the Exodus story and the different interpretations. So if you think this is just some cheesy kids movie, at least it talks about a legitimately fascinating event in Abrahamic lore. I definitely recommend you guys check out this film. Hell, they even have a prequel that covers the Book of Job, though I hear kind of mixed things on that. I haven't watched it, but it's there. I know this is not as brutal or depressing as stuff I usually cover, but don't write off as completely sanitized. There's more under the hood here than you might think. This is a good example of a family movie where there's layers to enjoy regardless of the age group. In fact, I really clicked with it a lot more as an adult than as a kid, since I could recognize what it was referencing and really take in the stakes at play here. Hell, this actually went on to be adapted into a stage play that, from what I understand, is still being performed. There's a legacy here, so even if you don't like the subject matter it covers or don't buy into any religious thing whatsoever, at least appreciate quality. Definitely give this movie a watch this Easter, you won't regret it. You can find it on your pirate side of choice or your grandma's VHS collection, because I know she probably has it. Until next time, please remember to like, comment, and subscribe. See you guys. Hey, loser. Do you want a shirt? Do you want a t-shirt? I have shirts now. Look in, look in the description for a link to a t-shirt you can buy. If you don't buy the t-shirt, I'll kill your family. If you don't buy the t-shirt, I'll poison your dog. If you don't buy the t-shirt, you're going to be the only person in town that does not have a t-shirt. Everyone's going to look at you funny. There's going to be social consequences to not having one of these t-shirts. I'm now making express threats of violence against you if you do not buy my t-shirt. I will call the police, tell them how they're not, you know, you're not buying my shirt. They're going to plant crack in your house, and they're going to arrest you and then beat you up in a jail cell. Buy my shirt.